Hello, all of you. How is everyone doing? Very well. Hi, Andy. Yeah, hi. Um, we're starting these videos by asking our contributors to introduce themselves and give us an overview of their work. So I'm going to let you pick who goes first and just see who starts speaking uh, because I'm a bad, I'm bad organiser. Um, but yeah, would you mind identifying yourself and telling us a little bit about, about the work you do, please? <laughs> yes, yeah, so we'll do alphabetical. I'm Holly Dugan. I teach in Washington, D.C. at the George Washington University. I'm a professor of um, English, um, associate professor of English, and I work on, I have two sort of research clusters. The first is on sensory history, um, particularly the history of the sense of smell, and then my other research interests are in critical animal studies. Thank you. I'm Marissa Nicosia. I am a, an assistant professor of Renaissance literature at the Penn State University's Abington College, and I live in Philadelphia. I have also two major fields of research. One is on literature and time, and one is on historical recipes. And that second field of research I explore in my public facing cooking in the archives project. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Lisa Smith. I'm a lecturer in digital history at the University of Essex, but I live in London. Um, my overall research theme is domestic medicine, broadly writ, which is all about how caregiving happens, how pain is experienced, and how recipes are prepared and used. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm hoping to return to all of those topics uh, across the space of these, this, this film, so wish me luck. Um, but the particular area we thought we'd talk about today, given our own historical moment, uh, and your uh, historical interests um, was the kind of the, the combination of recipes, smell, and plague. Um, does anyone want to start us off on one, two, or all of those topics? <laughs> uh, what I guess I'll start off saying is that plague and confinement to help uh, prevent the spread of disease was a very frequent experience in the early modern era that we all study. And it's marked in the historical records that we have, as well as the literature that we read from the period. Could you talk a bit more about that, Marissa, and about moving between those two fields of historical records and literature, um, where the issue of confinement lies in that, that boundary? So when you introduced yourself, I was really interested in the idea that you work on literature and time uh, but you also work on historical cookery, and I was expecting you to say literature and historical cookery. I was kind of interested just to where the literature and crops up in your research profile, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So the literature, figuring out how um, I'm going to write about literature and historical cookery together is actually the second book project that I'm going to be writing, hmm. which is going to think about um, seasonality and seasoning and try to bring together early modern understandings of the season with um, how people seasoned dishes that they ate or dishes that they preserved and put away. Um, so it, it does actually bring in some of those issues of temporality. It's just very, very new because <laughs> I'm still finishing my first book right now. Yeah, wow. I've never thought yeah. before that when I season my food, I'm imbuing it with the flavors of the moment. Mm -hmm. That's, wow, that's very eye-opening. Mm -hmm. And you um, may, consume it at a later date also you're also creating something that can be yeah terroir. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. so uh but back to your question about thinking about plague in multiple registers i think um as someone who does a lot of research on renaissance drama when i think about plague i think about the closure of public spaces like the public theaters the public playhouses and i think about um, the retreat from the city to the country um, to remove uh, oneself from tightly populated urban spaces if possible if at all possible financially and logistically for families and uh and in some cases, literature that actually explores issues of plague explicitly, but a lot of it is sometimes thought of as an absence of a theater season or an absence of people who could be uh, composed as an audience in a playhouse. Yeah, thank you. Um, Holly or Lisa, do you want to pick up on any of those ideas? I, I think 
for me when I think about the plague, it's not just the confinement, but it's also the terrible smells associated with the, the diseased body and how you could identify that, that it was, um, you know, that they, they smelled like they might be about to die. But beyond that, you know, that's also reflected, I think, in a lot of the plague recipes that they, the smell was associated with contagion and poisoning of the inside of the body. And so the, the smells of the remedies were directly intended to to treat that as, as much as anything, but that's, that's a uh, Holly's area as well. Yeah, for certain. I think one of the things that's so profound about plague and I think about our particular moment too, is that as a sensory, um, somebody who's interested in sensory history, we talk so much about sensory hierarchies and sort of how we think of the senses as a kind of visceral experience, but of course they've been cultivated over time, both in terms of, you know, time and history, mm -hmm. as Marissa is suggesting. Um, but in these heightened moments, they are thrown into relief and we realize, you know, all of these um, issues of habit that we have, touching our face, <laughs> um, and then also sort of really how vulnerable we are to the air around us and to the communities that we're working and um, walking through. And for me, that was one of the moments where I realized that this was an opportunity to sort of think through and see in the written record um, both what the norm was and then also under a heightened moment of crisis, what shifts um, were, were happening in real time. And for me, that brought the experience of plague from something that I kind of knew about into an embodied reality. I can remember very clearly being in the archives uh, in Blythe House, the sort of overflow of the Welcomes material collection in the basement. And pomanders, of course, are stored in all these different areas of the museum, of, of that archive collection and I, I'm walking through with a curator and I just you know was left alone at a certain moment with these objects that I knew had been used to you know possibly without much use to protect folks and I felt really freaked out about touching them I felt like I um, there was this possibility of this rupture of time where it just really effectively moved me and these small tiny objects and the, everything that was missing from them, the perfume that was used as protection and then the person who was trying you know, to use it to protect themselves, um, all were gone and all we have left is this sort of skeletal trace. <laughs> and so that for me was really um, both an intellectual problem to solve in terms of the writing of mm -hmm. history, but also one that I thought you know, made me care about this topic in a different way and what smell allows us to think about is lived reality, lived embodied experience of the past. And for me, that's always a question I'm deeply interested in exploring because it helps me understand my lived embodied experience of the present. I think what you're saying is really interesting because one of the striking things with modern you know, experience here is how invisible it is and that you can be carrying it and nobody would ever know where's the plague. Everybody knew if you had it. And so that we're lacking that sensory perception that there is something there so we're we're even more afraid i think because of that invisibility or maybe, maybe we aren't i think they were pretty terrified too but <laughs> yeah for me what that sort of triggers and sort of thinking is that that was certainly true one of the things that i was really interested at least in the earlier episodes of plague and i know we sort i fall sort of a little bit earlier than your expertise um, but i got really interested in the 1603 outbreak um, and partly it was because of rosemary as the sort of scent ingredient that was being used and sort of what the economic history of that shows us. There's price gouging, of course. Um, but of course, before that, rosemary was sort of a, a scent that was associated with betrothal, with love, um, with memory, remembrance. Memory. And what we see is a rapid sort of reconfiguration of this scent association, both with hope and then also with death. And so what I think one of the things that happens, at least when I think about this in terms of the history of smell, is that any smell started to freak people out. Just it was a reminder of the presence of that airborne, you know, they didn't, they thought of it as an airborne disease. And so as soon as you smelled any kind of strong scent, even though it started off as a kind of prophylactic um, preventative measure, it reminded you of other unseen, invisible assailants lurking in the air. And we can see the same xenophobia um, associated uh, with certain kinds of smells and communities um, um, erupting at that moment too. So that, that I agree. I think that it's a different experience of disease and outbreak, um, but the sensory moments uh, of shift are, are, are sort of familiar to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I, I for one have found it strange walking around a city in full spring bloom to try to get some exercise wearing a mask that prevents me from smelling spring um, in the way I want to smell it because it's preventing me from potential airborne um, transmission. And that's been a kind of interesting <laughs> way that this has played out with COVID-19. And Holly, it connects to kind of what you're saying about the uh, unmarked nature that we fear as opposed to this kind of heightened fear of the strong smell that may be hope or maybe preventative or maybe harbinger. Yeah, it's yeah. so weird right now. Also, it's like, is it hay fever? <laughs> is it COVID-19? Why am I, you know, and also I think just temporality wise, it's so, I mean, DC is sort of heightened allergy moment right now. And it just feels particularly terrible timing to have everybody sneezing at the same time as Lisa's suggesting. We're so fearful of contact and who is, you know, who is the secret spreader? <laughs> in our midst. Mm -hmm. It'd be you and you'd never know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Which mm -hmm. is the best way to think about that, I think, at all, at all times. Mm -hmm. And from what Lisa was saying earlier, the difference um, with plague is that that doubt about who's got it wouldn't exist. Did I get that right, Lisa? Well, yes. I mean, they could see somebody was evidently sick, but there was also, like you were saying with, is it hay fever or is it COVID? I mean, they also had that ambiguity is it bubonic plague or is it venereal disease? Is it something else that it's a oozing, leaking, stinking body? Um, so sometimes the recipes also try to treat multiple things at the same time, but always with an underlying idea that they're a poisoned body in some way. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Holly talked earlier about the possibility of ruptures of time. And I guess that's kind of been hovering around everything we've been saying so far about mm -hmm how our historical understanding of plague informs our experiences now. But I guess that process will work in the other way too. I don't know about you three, but certainly for me, I'm thinking very differently about um, people who decide to open playhouses whose business model depends on gathering strangers together at a time of plague. And also the people for whom the playhouses get closed down for, i.e. the people who are stubbornly still going to the theatre, even though it's very likely that they will be in close proximity with someone with plague. Um, I don't know, does, does the current situation feel like it will impact on your own relationship with your material, the questions you might ask of it? For me, one of the things, again, that I think I missed in my exploration of shut-in households, I was really interested in sort of the um, aspect of fear and transmission of what it might mean to be shut in uh, with someone who is ill. And I was thinking about that as somebody who's very healthy. I wasn't a mother yet. I was, um, you know, just sort of really having my um, autonomous self sort of think through that in this moment and not in a networked and connected community. And what I would say that this experience has given me that's changed is that, you know, I've had to decide who's in my household, who's in my essential crew. And they're not the people I would have necessarily had it predicted. And they, I, am, I feel quite moved by that and recognizing and seeing um, a kind of community response. Um, and I think I miss some of that aspects. I don't think I thought of that shut-in experience in quite the emotionally poignant way and what caretaking might have meant in that moment for those, those members. And then also thinking through who is essential and who is not, you know, essential in terms of um, what we now see um, as caretaking, but also who is also seen as disposable um, in, in that society. And so I always um, think about Rochelle Munkoff's work on women searchers of the dead, those who were, as you know, Andy, as you're saying, those who are like those who are <laughs> ride or die playhouse attendees um, versus who is going to do the work of going door to door and censusing, you know, sensing and, and also doing a census of who's ill, what households have been affected. Um, and those were elderly women um, who were seen as vulnerable, you know, sort of who, who could be lost in this community who would do that work. And so that for me is something that um, I feel differently <laughs> about now, um, having had this experience. And I think I did certainly, I'm um, just reading about it uh, in the past. 
that yeah, I, I I guess I was thinking too as you were talking of those pictures of um, you know the the skeletons dancing. So on the theme of playhouses and entertainment, but at the same time, it's there and it's waiting, and you don't know when it's going to hit, and it's you know who's going to be left and who's going to be left out, and who are the expendable ones, and it's it's really. It, it makes me see the art in a different way as well. Can you say more about that, Lisa? Uh, no, it's just uh, the one image I'm, I've got in my head right now is actually a later image, but it's the, the famous picture, and I can't remember who did it, but the famous picture of the, the skeleton embracing and kissing the woman, and you know, she's got the, the rip in her back, but it's more the dancing with death, and it seems on the one hand that, it, you know, it's very intimate, right? And before you could, you'd, you could take a very, intellectual look at it but actually now looking at it i i see it on a more emotional level of you know it's there it's always there mm -hmm. whereas you know our day-to-day -day lives up until fairly recently were much more you know death is there but it's not present right whereas now it feels present in a, in a way that i think early modern people experienced even outside of plague time it was much more a lived day-to-day -day thing um Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that's right. Marissa. Yeah, and I've, I've been thinking about the ways that historical recipe books show families accumulating medicinal receipts and culinary receipts for all sorts of potentially unforeseen um, things that might come up in the future. So you need some good wound care, you need some plague care, you need... Um, recipes for um, things related to women's um, miscarriage, birth, uh, to cancer, things like that. So they, they bring together all this medical knowledge um, and it's unclear to what extent these recipes actually worked to address the particular um, ailments that they're designed to address and if they were acquired um, or used in times of crisis or as a kind of preventative, build, I'm building a recipe collection to care for my family in the event that any of these things happen. And uh, Elaine Leong's work, um, her new book, Recipes and Everyday Knowledge, does such a great job showing how uh, recipe trials would happen in the home to address a particular situation at hand. And I've been feeling a lot of, uh, that, that's always been a, pr a process that seems so opaque to me, but never in my life have I had to just simply stay in my home to isolate myself from a contagion because there is no cure for it. So even when there is an, in you, if you are diagnosed with something incurable in America, you go to the doctor and you have a rich course of treatment available to you, maybe experimental, but it is uh, a treatment that you receive outside of the home within the medical system. But uh, we're at a, a moment where I'm uh, thinking about some of those, those recipes that were gathered in crisis or were gathered in, um, in aims of pre preparing uh, in, a, in a slightly different way. I'm, I'm not used to encountering um, a contagion that's incurable as a, in, and that's all about my privilege as a, um, a, a white educated person in a, in a wealth, wealthy country, right? Um, and it's been interesting to turn back to the recipe books with this perspective. It's all right. It's a, it's a oh, sorry. No, go on, mm -hmm. sorry. I, I was just thinking though, um, as, you, as you were talking about that, that the privilege is also there in their recipe books too, because you know, the expense of so many of the ingredients and in plague recipes and the time involved of preparing them, you know, it's, this isn't for just anybody. It's not just taking a one herb as a, as a one-off, but actually, you know, really trying out quite elaborate things with, with a lot of medicines that you could have only had from the apothecary, which then, you know, thinking of the way we're getting food and groceries delivered, how are they getting these things from the apothecary? Who's bringing them? And if it's okay, if it's okay to add to Lisa's questions, um, just thinking about people listening to this who will be completely new to the idea of a recipe book, recipe book as a historical genre. Um, I don't know what our current moment is, but certainly my cultural moment, it feels like we tend to think of recipe books as being all about deliciousness. And certainly since I've met Marissa, uh, the deliciousness of my life has gone up in lots of ways. It's been great hanging out with her and learning about food. But, but you know, on the one hand, we have a kind of deliciousness genre of recipe book, which is, you know, fry uh, sugar in butter and then be happy. And then on the other hand, we've got the kind of 
ultra health conscious books which say take a stick of celery and nibble it and be happy um those seem to be the kind of two genres in our culture perhaps i miss perhaps that's a, a bit of a cliche um but what, what what is the what is the recipe book in this in the period we're talking about the early modern recipe book just to add a really big question to Lisa's ones. <laughs> Lisa, either of us can do this. Do you want to do it or do you want me to do it? <laughs> um, well, how about if I say a few things and you say a few things? Okay. Um, so a recipe book in this period was often compiled by the family. And Elaine Leon talks quite a bit about this as well. Um, so lots of people were adding to it. You might even have visitors who came by or you'd exchange recipes and they'd add them in. But these weren't just food recipes. There were a lot of medicinal ones. Um, and those are the things that Elaine was especially talking about, which is the trying out of these types of medicinal recipes. Um, Marissa. So I would add that we're operating in a cultural moment oh, in, the seven, in the 16th and 17th centuries. We're operating in a cultural moment where medicine and food are indistinguishable and care of the body, the mind, and the spirit is, is holistically oriented. So there are some things that you see in early modern recipe books that look like food, but are thought to be a highly medicinal preparation for care for the body. So the um, recipe for me that I see a lot that I think is right at the center of this Venn diagram is posset, because posset is often um, heavily spiced alcohol with cream, sometimes eggs, and the ideal time to consume a posset is right before bed, and it is supposed to help you sleep, and it's supposed to help you have good digestion while you sleep, but it's also supposed to be pleasing. It's supposed to be like a tasty, alcohol, spicy alcohol and heavy cream beverage that you're supposed to enjoy before you sleep, but really you're drinking it because it's supposed to have this um, kind of cleansing effect on the body to allow you to digest while you sleep and then um, wake up and be able to uh, defecate properly and then go on with your day as a healthful person. So it, like, it, it could, it's designed to be both delicious, but also healthful. And I think the recipe books show a culture where food and medicine are far more intertwined um, than, we, no, than we've necessarily come to think about food and medicine in our dominant culture. Yeah, I was excited. I was going through a, a recipe book by Margaret Baker, who was doing hers in 1675, um, <clears throat> which I, I once had a class do quite a bit of work on. Um, but she had one for green walnuts that came up when I was looking for plague things particularly. And I thought, because I'd seen these recipes all the time, and I thought, green walnuts? Turns out she actually specifies that if you take these once a day, you will manage to preserve yourself from the plague. And I thought, so all those other ones that were just talking about it, I thought this was basically pickled nuts, and they didn't have that little detail. And so there's that implied usage that they knew that you could either eat them as a treat or you could eat them as a medicine. But it's only when somebody specifies it that you can sometimes make those connections. Mm -hmm. Holly, can we relate this to the work that you do around smell? Um, well, I have two thoughts really listening to this, because again, I'm not somebody who, you know, I'm, I'm more thinking about the mechanics of how we might use recipes as evidence. And so I have two thoughts about this. One is that, you know, the recipe book and reading it is, you, the, the impulse is to create a narrative, right? You read, you know, when I've taught them, it's sort of like there's eight recipes about rickets and then there's a recipe about weaning and one wonders about that sequencing, right? That there's a sort of, a particularly, is there a connection between this about, especially if the rickets are a receipt that sort of seems as though it's a, for the children in the family. And that's one of those questions that we can't ever know and it has to, it puts pressure on how we read that text. Um, is it about reading an individual recipe? Is it about, as Lisa and Marissa are suggesting, really thinking about it um, as, uh, um, you know, it's sort of in terms of epistemologies of experimentation and the history of science and medicine, and then also about the history of domesticity and care and families and wealth and privilege. Um, and of course, there's more folks, I'm thinking of Rebecca Larash's work about who tends the low fire, um, even if that's what the, the, the record is. And then the second thing I'm thinking about is sort of how we might solve some of those issues and then bring in a different kind of archive and, and connect that. And for me, it's you know, thinking about poetry, thinking about highly 
artificial constructed <laughs> representations of some of these same questions. And so for me, I wanted to look at a recipe or recipes about perfume history, including recipes that referenced um, how to create pomander beads, how to deal and think about pomanders as receptacles, um, and then also as, um, um, I guess, the prescription. Um, but then thinking about something where <laughs> Robert Herrick is totally taking it in a different way, eroticizing it. He wants to smell Julia's pomander beads um, for traces of her body and not necessarily as a kind of protection. He just wants to, as you were saying, Andy, he wants to attend. He wants to be <laughs> close with her. He wants to smell her, even if it means um, engaging with the danger of plague. And mm -hmm. that's something I think is really important as well here is that there's, um, there's, there's multiple kinds of approaches that any individual takes in these moments of crisis. And we have to sort of think through the heterogeneity of this experience. And I think what we're all after is sort of thinking through what these micro histories um, tell us and how we use them as evidence in terms of, of changing the macro understanding of a cultural experience like plague or a cultural experience like COVID-19, novel COVID-19. That was brilliant, thank you. Um, if it's okay, we're moving towards the end of our time together, so I wonder if we might turn to the final question we're asking our contributors, which is um, about this weird, strange word literature and what it might uh, or might not mean to you either personally or professionally. Um, so you're welcome to answer this um, as personally or professionally as you like and in relation to any part of your, your professional um, uh, profile. But yes, literature, what is it? <laughs> Lisa? Oh, sure. It's love it at the historian. <laughs> um, love it back if you want. I mean, one of, one of the things I, I often think about is how, how these sources I look at often have a you know, there's a level of genericness to them, that there's certain ways you create, say, a recipe, you know, they always begin, take such and such, and then do all of these things to them. So that in itself is kind of a cross between literature, but there's also an orality to it. Um, but also letters, you know, there's a very standardized way of writing those letters, or, you know, the, the, the narratives that people write about their lives, there's standard things that they do. So, I think as a historian, we need to be attuned to the ways in which these sources we look at can be literary as well as historical sources. But I think historians sometimes forget about that level. As do literature scholars. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Holly? I love that answer. I think for me, literature, um, I'm always interested in literature as an archive of what it can tell us about lived experience in the past. And I think um, for some historical questions in which the historical record is, you know, um, underdeveloped, say sensory experience, right? This thing that, you know, the very thing that um, makes sensory representations in literature um, not valid as historical evidence is that it's too subjective, it's, you know, too rooted in a particular individual experience is also one of the things I think that in this particular question of sensory history makes it valuable as well. And for me, I think one of the things I'm interested in, I know um, I'm a fan of this uh, series, and so I know at other moments you've been thinking about non-discursive experience. And I actually think literature, ironically enough, offers us a lot of evidence of that non-discursive experience, even you know, not unproblematically, but I think in reaching towards what language can do in terms of metaphor, um, if we are thoughtful about it, it actually points us towards that absence in a really poignant and powerful way. And um, the, the recipe, the, the poem, um, and I think even the plays of the period tell us all a little bit about what we're looking at at the center of that, which is what did it feel like to live through that experience in London in 1603 or on a household and, you know, 1660. Um, again, really thinking through, through that. Thank you. Marissa. So I think literature allowed 16th and 17th century writers to imagine the world that they were in and imagine other mm -hmm. possible worlds in verse or in prose. And I think um, that genre allows for the kinds of conventions that 
Lisa was mentioning with the recipe or with the letter. And I'm always really interested in how um, writers from the period play with genre and play with both its um, both its affordances and manage its pitfalls. And I think recipe writers do really playful things when they're writing recipes. They like using verbs like mingle, which are both specific um, to technique, but also are quite evocative. Or they ask um, you to do things as you like as sweet or as much cinnamon as you like sometimes, or to your taste. So they allow for play within a structure, a known form or a known genre. I think there's a lot there that's similar to what um, a playwright does working on a new play for a playhouse or what um, a poet does when they're writing a sonnet. Thank you very much, all three of you. This has been the most wonderful conversation. Um, I love the idea of you uh, working on recipes gathered at a moment of crisis. Uh, and in many ways, it's what the four of us have been doing today in this film, it feels like uh, to me. I love that, that, I, that warning about the impulse to create narrative. Um, and sometimes that itself kind of being a, a problem when it comes to us trying to access this stuff, um, as opposed to the non-discursive experience of much of the material um, that you're talking about. And I really like the idea of both the people then and us now using literature to try and imagine the world around them. Um, and I guess now also imagine the world, the very changed, strange world around us as well. Um, thank you very much, all three of you. Um, and we very much hope we can get you back onto the series another time. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. Thank you.